Well, hi guys, it's that time. It's our Bible teaching snippet of the day. Well, you can see I'm in my car uh, and I've actually got the car running with the air conditioner on. I think it's 96 degrees here in Memphis today. Uh, I'm out and about, I have a few errands to run, but I wanna hop on and do a short teaching, okay? Uh, I've been talking about penal substitutionary atonement. That means that God substituted Jesus in our place and beat and killed him uh, to make things right with him and basically it was a bartering uh, deal okay I'll kill Jesus so I don't have to kill you and take my wrath out on you and you know um some of us have never heard anything other than that, okay? Uh, the time that I've been in Christianity for 14 years, that is really, it, it, it doesn't matter if I'm in an Assembly of God, Church of God, Baptist Church, uh, Methodist Church, uh, whether I'm at a Baptist seminary college or if I'm in a uh, charismatic movement colleges that teach healing and uh, the goodness of God, uh, we still have these twisted ideas that God is a wrathful, angry God, and his justice has to be appeased and bartered out. Uh, and I'm challenging that because that was not the belief of the early church. And when I say the early church, I'm talking about from the time of Jesus through the first century, through all of the early church fathers, uh, this belief has never, ever been in the Greek Orthodox Church, which is uh, the Eastern Church, okay? Uh, they've always spoke Greek. They've always understood Scripture very clearly because they, that is their native language. And they have never, ever, ever thought that God was mad at mankind, so he thought he would beat and punish his own son so he could get in a happy mood. Uh, basically like pouring out this hot cup of wrath on his own dearly beloved innocent son so that he could look past our uh, poo-poo, right? Okay, so, so far in this series, okay, uh, I've talked about several different things that do doesn't add up to me, and it never did quite honestly, guys, okay? But uh, it makes you think about things when you start studying the false doctrine of hell and how it was never part of the early church teachings. And, you know, you've got to believe in a wrathful, angry God to believe that God is going to punish someone for all eternity for a sin or some sins that lasted maybe, say, a person lived 80 or 90 years, and instead of God punishing them for 80 or 90 years, he's going to punish them for millenniums, ageless, ageless times. Uh, that doesn't sound like justice and fairness to me. Uh, that sounds uh, a little bit distorted. So uh, yesterday I went down and I said some things about what this penal substitutionary doctrine uh, pits us with. It pits the father against the son the father's wrath against the son's forgiveness. It makes God beholden to a law or justice for anger and wrath, and God is actually himself under a law that he has to follow to satisfy justice. It requires the debt of sin to be paid back. There's no free gift. That, that should make you pause and think about what we're believing. And sin must be paid back through punishment. The torment of the sinner satisfies God's need for wrath. That's a problem. And it paints God as retributive instead of restorative. Instead of restoring people, he just wants to punish them and get even with them. Uh, it distorts divine justice uh, because actually divine justice is a judgment for us to bring us back into uh, fullness and restore us to who we were, and that's called justice, okay? There's a verse in Psalms, and I don't have it pulled up. It says, uh, justice and mercy meet and kiss one another, and that's what God did through Jesus, okay? Now, the next thing uh, I talked about just real quickly it was, does, God, does sin separate us from God? These are questions we need to be asking. Must sin really be punished? Does punishment really restore justice? Uh, does punishment of a sinner truly satisfy God's wrath? Does punishment pay for forgiveness and how and why? Uh, can or must God's wrath against sin be satisfied by punishment before he can forgive what otherwise 
uh, could not be. In other words, before I can forgive my husband for something he's done wrong, does he actually need to go buy flowers and bring them to me to talk me down off of my high horse, as we would call it, so I won't be mad at him and hit him in the head when he walks in the front door? Well, I went through a lot of these different ones yesterday, okay? Uh, let, let me keep reading. If a guilty person's offense really erased uh, the punishment of yet another substitute victim, uh, rather than an eye for an eye, why would taking the perfect eye on an innocent third party absolve me of sin? So this eye for an eye with God. So he's got to have somebody pay for wrongdoing. And so instead of me paying for what I've done wrong, Jesus has to pay for it. That's what he's talking about here. And of course I said, Father, forgive them. Uh, was it God's will that we sacrifice Jesus for him? Were we being forgiven by sacrificing Jesus so that we could be forgiven uh, for killing him? Uh, he says this is uh, dizzying because it, it's contradictory. It's pitting goodness and evil, and it's just, and it doesn't really actually make sense when you slow down and think about what we're believing. Uh, are the guilty agents of their own atonement as God allows them to commit the very act of sin? for which they are being punished and by which they are being saved. If my crucified, if my sin crucified Jesus, then didn't my sin of crucifying Jesus get me uh, forgiveness or pay for my sin of killing Jesus? This seems like a secular reasoning to me or simply nonsensical. Now, here's what I want to ask you to please pray about for me, okay? Was the mission of Jesus to save us from an angry God, from his Father? Or was Jesus' mission to save all of mankind from Satan, sin, and death? I propose to you that Jesus' mission was to come and undo what Adam did, to undo uh, the power that Satan had over us, the devil, uh, which is death. He came to undo what Adam did and what we have done by following in Adam's footsteps. I believe Jesus' mission was to come and restore us. So I want to read a couple of things here. And he talks about this in this book. This is what I'm reading from, by the way, okay? And he says, we must consider what Jesus himself said. And he lists three different scriptures uh, that I'm going to talk to you about. But here's what Jesus said he came for, to announce the good news of the kingdom in Luke chapter 4 demonstrate God's compassionate love for the world, that's John chapter 3, and to seek and find and save us, ultimately giving his life for a ransom for many, and that's found in Mark 10.45. And he talks about that the ransom implies that we're being set free some, from someone or something that is holding us in bondage. Our rescue, salvation, and redemption are from captors and from prisons. Question, who is the captor? Prison warden or slave owner? Is it God? He is never. He has never treated as such in Jesus' message. Instead, God in Christ is the Redeemer, the Rescuer, and the Savior. Okay, uh, now watch what, watch how Jesus says who is going to crucify him and hurt him. This is Matthew 20, verses 18 and 19. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and the teachers of the law. They will condemn, they, not God, okay, they will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. Okay, right here, nothing is said about God being in the middle of this, okay? In this uh, scheme, where does the Father fit in? Is he behind it, inspiring them? No, Jesus and the gospel writers point to Satan and wicked men, those who are inspired by who inspired the betrayal and the murder of Jesus. Did you know in Acts, Stephen says that Jesus was murdered by the religious leaders? It doesn't say that God murdered him and that the Father was using him as something or that God put him out there for them to do it. It simply indicates that the religious leaders rejected Jesus and murdered him. Now, um, I want to talk to you real quick. I'm going to keep going. And, uh, we also see... 
here in according to Jesus of the Gospels and the Gospel writers themselves, God sent his son with good news of love, and then we responded by killing him. Something about giving his life, which is uh, includes more than dying, okay? It's not just about dying, okay? In this, calls sets us free and gives us life. So Jesus' mission, again, his calls, was to set us free and to give us life. So how and from what, according to Jesus, I hear three answers in his mouth. We are set free through his death because rather than replying to our vengeance and violence, in like kind, Jesus lives out his own message of love by forgiving us for his murder. Number two, he sets us free from death and the fear of death when we join in him a kind of death that nullifies death. The first time Jesus talks about the cross, he does not yet reveal that he would be crucified, but he uses it as a symbol of ultimate commitment to following his way interesting. That's something to ponder on. So carrying his cross is not necessary to necessarily toting on his back, carrying on his back a death instrument. Carrying his cross means a way of living how he would lay down his life for everyone else for their benefit. His living life, okay? It's like me uh, giving up something in my life to help other people. I didn't actually physically die, but I gave up something for the benefit and the betterment of someone else, okay? The next thing, let's see. Here it is. Let me pick up. It says, uh, it's a call to lose our lives, even unto death itself, for his sake. Okay. The next one, number three. Jesus sees his death as an hour of glory for the Son of Man, fulfilling Daniel chapter 7, a cup of suffering leading to glorification. He becomes the first seed of many to harvest uh, in a harvest movement that finds eternal life by giving our lives to God's kingdom dream. Let me read the scripture that he quotes here. This is Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, John 12 23 through 25. And Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seed. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. As with Jesus, giving our lives includes but exceeds the hour of our death. It is dedicating our whole lives to love. And that's in Matthew 13, 31. Um, let's see. I think that's about all I want to do today because I've already gone as far as I want. I'm just reading you a little bit out of this book to help you connect the dots of what Jesus' real message was about why he came and how we've kind of flipped it into a different uh, message over the last 500 years. I'm going to say it one more time. Penal substitutionary atonement was not a foundation. Well, let me say it a different way. Did you know penal substitutionary atonement, putting Jesus in our place on a cross and killing him so God can pour his wrath out on Jesus and not us, has only been a belief or doctrine for about 500 years in Christianity. Okay? It was not... Uh, the predominant uh, teaching prior to that, and it was never, ever, never, ever the teaching of the apostles or the early church, and it never has been the teaching of the Greek Orthodox Church uh, from the days of Christianity, uh, the beginning. I'm talking first century with Jesus and the men who sat under Jesus and the men who sat under his apostles. This was never part of their teaching we have somehow made it the gospel. This is what's so bad about it. Did you know everything that American denominations and churches believe is based on penal substitutionary atonement? When we go out and minister to people, we use that as the gospel. And that is simply not the true gospel. You better say you're sorry to God and say you love his son so God won't be mad at you and he'll put Jesus in your place so you won't be judged, punished, and go to hell for all eternity. These two doctrines, the false doctrine of eternal punishment in a lake of fire called hell from an angry, wrathful God, it lines up and ties together 
well, let me do it like this. These two doctrines have met each other and kissed, where justice and mercy kiss one another in Psalms. Watch what happens. The wrath of God and penal substitution have met and kissed each other, and they have become our false gospel that we preach all around America. And when we go out on missionary journeys, we use that as the true gospel and it's not it's not the true gospel the true gospel is that jesus came to introduce god the father to you to bring you back home to him for god so loved loved the world that he sent his only son it doesn't doesn't say he hated you so much he sent his son to warn you okay i gotta sign off i love you and i'll see you here tomorrow bye-bye